Hey, off a day and hello. Uh, we'd like to welcome you to the final breakout session of today. Um, here presenting is uh, Mr. Michael Blas Macchio, AIA, uh, presenting Historic Preservation 2.0. Uh, Mr. Macchio, a Chamorro and Hawaiian by ancestry, has practiced architecture and historic preservation advocacy for over 30 years on Guam, the CNMI, and Hawaii. His practices focuses on historic preservation, sustainable architecture, smart growth planning, and contextualism. Michael is the managing principal of TRMA Plus Architects and the chairman of the Guam Preservation Trust and the Guam Historic Preservation Review Board. Please welcome me in uh, welcoming Mr. McKeo and his presentation. Thank you very much. That was a lovely obituary. <laughs> So this is the recap part of the day. You know, as I said, I don't want to stand between you folks and your happy hour. So we're probably going to break it up into maybe two categories of discussion and just kind of recap a little bit of the tech discussions from earlier today. And then the second half of it is a little bit more about um, social media collaboration and advocacy steps that we can take moving forward, all right? So we'll go ahead and hit the first slide. We'll try to get through these as quickly as possible. Um, yeah, there we go. So, you know, up on the screen, you see the traditional historic preservation tools, right? So we've got the shovels, we've got the holes, we've got, you know, people up to their necks in sand and dirt. Um, we know that, you know, these, these older um, strategies, they took months or years. We know that the work could be dangerous sometimes. We know that the, sometimes artifacts couldn't be reached. Uh, we know that there were accidental, there was accidental damage sometimes by contractor, and I know that's debatable, right? But, you know, it is what it is. Uh, next slide. So, cut to today, and this is a little bit more of what we're starting to see on site, right? We're starting to see, I mean, as you may have seen today, a lot of use of drones, a lot of discussion about LIDAR, and that guy in the upper right corner there could either be playing PlayStation or a full-fledged archaeologist. We don't know, right? But that is the direction that we start to see things going. And there are a lot of benefits that can be talked about and a lot of challenges that need to be addressed as well. Next slide. So again, just recapping, you may have seen these, some of these slides earlier. So LiDAR. Again, it's the big topic, it's the, it's the flavor of the day, and it's a lot like photovoltaics and electric cars changing every day. Um, it's currently in that moment where it's getting more and more expensive because it's getting more and more sophisticated. We know that if you get an Apple, uh, Apple an iPhone 12, um, Apple has come out with their version of LiDAR. Yeah, so that's going to that's going to be that's either going to be awesome or really terrifying, you know, because your 12 year old will start showing you his house designs. Um, right. So um, again, so the technology of it is it's been around for a while and it's just becoming a lot more sophisticated, but also becoming a lot more accessible. And the other part of it was the inertia of getting kind of the historic preservation culture to make the shift. I mean, we're so used to the tools that we grew up with. And then someone comes along and says, hey, wait a minute, I can do things twice as fast, half as dirty. And every, you know, the old guard goes, nah, nah, we like it the old way, right? We like, we like getting dirty. Um, but again, so that's kind of the, the big jump about where things have gone, right? We're dealing with technology now that is supposed to make um, historic preservation and advocacy of preservation more convenient, right? But again, the big step there is to remember the responsibilities that go along with having access to all this new information and having all these new toys, right? Next slide. So I, I like this slide. Uh, so this is, uh, Lana and I were talking about it a little while ago. So subsurface x-rays been around for a while. And so the hope in the dream was that if we can get x-ray technology developed far enough along, we can get to situations like this. And on the top, you can see the outline of, of skeletal remains at our subsurface. And so just below that is the same set of skeletal remains after it was excavated. Again, from the preservation standpoint, and when you're talking about preservation in place and sacred places, so again, if the technology 
in the islands, in the Pacific Islands, if we can access this technology, make it part of our normal process, you know, that can be an enormous time saver and it can really change how the conversation about historic remains happens, right? Because again, I know one of the biggest misconceptions out there is that archaeologists want to find these, you know, human remains. That, is, that, that could not be further from the truth. I mean, it's almost an oath that they take that, you know, they don't disturb it if they can avoid disturbing it. But again, dealing with the older technology, the, the way that you found it was to disturb it. So by default, you're starting, you know, a step, one step ahead, two steps back, right? Um, so again, in terms of goals, when we start to look at how to use this technology, those are the kinds of things that we're looking at because, again, we're tired of the headlines. Next slide. You know, I mean, that alone, I mean, I, I can hear the groans <laughs> whenever we talk about that. You know, it just, there are things that are coming online now. There's technology that is coming online now that can make the preparation and the planning in advance of any kind of development or construction or clearing, they can make that a lot more palatable for everybody. And again, if it's the, the other goal would be to make sure that when we're approaching that work, that we're doing it collaboratively, sharing information, sharing data. So again, an example of how the technology can be used. Next slide. Okay, so this is, a, this is actually a video, and it's just a snippet. We don't have to go through. There's not a lot of video with this one, so go ahead and play video. And you may have seen versions of this this morning. I think um, Aaron, in his, in his presentation, was showing the use of LIDAR to prepare drawings and images, right? So you want to go ahead? Yeah, there you go. And so these are, the one difference about Aaron's site says, I believe he showed an industrial complex. I'm showing historic buildings. <laughs> the, there you go, there you go. It's like, it's not quite historic, <laughs> but you know, it can, maybe, 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 right? Depends, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, by a lot of definitions, I'm historic. So anyway, that's one example of a historic um, facility, uh, you know, that needed to be, surveyed, and again, when we think about why and what the outcomes are, so this particular building was actually dangerous to go into. So you know you've got a valuable property, you know you've got a facility that needs to be restored, so how do you do that and not endanger people, you know? So how can, you know, the engineers, the uh, historic structure uh, uh, architects and, and engineers get in there and not damage things? So. I think we can go to the next slide. Just a couple of examples of that. So again, run the animation or the video. Okay. New technology this is an ancient civilization pretty popular. in Central America. May have been several times bigger and much more complex than archaeologists My buddy believe. Gail. Scientists say they use lasers to expose previously unknown Mayan cities and thousands of structures. The high-tech mapping surveyed about 800 square miles of Guatemala. David Begno is here with what we're learning about this mysterious civilization. David, good morning to you. It's interesting, Gail. Good morning. Explorers would spend days trekking through the hot and dangerous jungles of Guatemala looking for Mayan ruins. Now within seconds, new technology is helping them pinpoint thousands of hidden archaeological treasures they didn't even know existed. Indiana Jones could have only dreamed of this. Archaeologists are using high-level mapping technology to virtually unearth a massive network of Mayan ruins hidden for centuries in the thick jungles of Guatemala. As far as the eye can see, just jungle. Albert Lin is an engineer and National Geographic explorer who worked on a television special about the breakthrough. So we had this augmented reality platform built based off of the LiDAR data. You know, it says there's a massive temple just around the corner. Ah, oh, it gives you, like, chills up your back. The uncovered landscape includes previously unknown cities and more than 60,000 interconnected structures, including houses, farms, highways, and even pyramids. Scientists and archaeologists discovered the ruins by shooting lasers down from a plane to penetrate the dense jungle canopy. The technology is called Light Detection and Ranging, or LIDAR. Marian Hernandez is president of PACUNAM, 
the Guatemala nonprofit that started the project to uncover more of the Mayan civilization. It will uh, provide empirical proof of the sophistication and complexity of their settlement systems. Francisco Estrada Belli is co-director of the Pacunum Project. He says LIDAR technology is revolutionizing archaeology, quite like the Hubble telescope revolutionized astronomy. When they started looking at, through that telescope, they found thousands of galaxies, and that's what we're seeing. We're part of the jungle. We thought they were empty, uh, are full of cities and small towns and amazing things that we didn't suspect were there. So previous assessments estimated just one or two million people lived in the Mayan lowlands, but now researchers believe as many as 20 million people may have lived there. You can watch Lost Treasures of the Mayan Snake Kings this Tuesday on National Geographic. I love that kind of stuff. Wow, that's one to record for the kids. I agree. I love those discoveries hidden for so long. Yeah. Well, they, the researchers said they had been walking, essentially walking on them, but never noticed them until they started looking from the air, shooting yeah. laser down. And they found that secret room in the Great Pyramid. It's great. Thanks, David. I love this stuff. Yeah. David. <laughs> Nerd alert. <laughs> Go to the next slide. I'm going to watch it right now. But um, I think in all of our communities, Palau, you know, in FSM, in CNMI, there are those instances where there are resources that are concealed. And we don't need to damage the jungles. We don't need to mess with the forest. We don't need to uh, disturb, you know, native species of plants or animals to get to them. We can start to look for them in these alternate ways and improve our understanding of it before we start, you know, digging it up, right? Uh, the other thing that's become very common um, in the historic preservation world has been the use of LIDAR uh, formed images to animate, to show people what, how things were actually being used, how spaces were actually being used. Because, I mean, waiting for the restoration work to be done, can, it, it's, not a, it's not a fast process, it takes a while. So uh, this is also a animation, but you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna skip to the next one. That's Kamehameha's, uh, uh, yeah, so this one, Go ahead and run this video, if you can. Oops, no, those are the dinosaurs. Go back one. <laughs> there we go. So this is actually a recreation. So they took information the from LIDAR. The located at the Hawaii Plantation Village, shows the movement from traditional Hawaiian housing to more Western-style plantation structures. In Hawaii, in the mid-1800s, housing like the Hale Noa was the only option for immigrant workers on these plantations. As you can see, it is based on Hawaiian construction techniques, but also utilizes some Western structural features. The Hale Noa shows that Hawaiians adopted doors, windows, and metal roofing, all with the construction techniques called lashing, without nails, and with lulu palms for the coverings. And so it goes on to show some of the details uh, that people, that, that, that preservationists and archaeologists have determined were part of this type of a recreation. And again, so what we're doing is we're moving around the older method of digging things up and you know, possibly disturbing them, and this way we can recreate conditions uh, and learn from that and just use that as a place to store all the, no the information and knowledge that we've gained. So going on to the next slide. Okay, and here we are today, historic preservation, advocacy, and data sharing, right? So in the old days, <laughs> the slide on, the, on your left is not that one, we'll have the historical society after us, right? So I mean, uh, preservationists and heritage advocates are, you know, they're there because of passion. Um, what has become more obvious now is that how communities feel, and I'm going to specify that, how Pacific Islander communities feel about their resources, their historic resources, and their heritage resources has to be part of the discussion. It's no longer the, the sterile discussion of, oh, is, does it meet this date? Was the person who built this building significant in some very Western definition? Because for most of us in the Pacific Island communities, our sacred places, our historic sites, don't fall into those categories. And one of the big challenges for all of the, our islands is going to be 
in our own grassroots effort, defining what makes something historically relevant. Because we can't rely on someone saying, well, that's where the former president of the United States slept. That's not a criteria for us, right? So we have to put in our criteria. We were talking to groups earlier today about traditional cultural properties. Where was the location where traditional fishing activities took place? That's relevant to us. That defines historic relevance to us, right? Um, all the activities, again, we were talking with two groups that were in, involved with Sackman and ocean, ocean um, travel, you know, the, the historic methods of working with Sackman. And that kind of activity is relevant to us. That helps us define what's important. And that is our Pacific Island community's definition. That's what has to be uh, achieved. That's, that's the end goal. So, uh, next slide. Okay, yeah, so that's really what we're talking about here is we're focusing on what makes us different. So some of you know kind of the background of how the National Register was created. So the National Register was a very, I'm, it was a wonderful document in some ways, but it was very much geared toward uh, the way that the mainland United States viewed historic sites and it, sort of by default, how historic preservation was treated in a lot of European countries. Again, we don't fall into those categories. Those categories don't apply. Uh, and so again, the, the challenge and the obligation is for us to come together, look at elements like our, our traditional activities, the life ways, the priorities uh, that we espoused when we were, I'm sorry, for, for each of our communities before, and I, the, the before is the big before with quotes you know, before modern events happen. Next slide. Okay, so um, a little bit down the road, I'm gonna, in a few moments, I'll play you another video, but there's a couple things that we really wanna focus on for this conference. Okay, so that group up there, APIA HIP, stands for Asians and Pacific Islanders, Islander Americans in Historic Preservation. So GPT was instrumental in the creation of that organization, and it has grown. So I believe in that first official year, it truly, we were there at the beginning. So it started with a group of like 20 people, and then the following year we met up at another conference and it was 40, and then a year later we met up again and it was 80. And then this conference, we had about 150 people. We had it in San Francisco, and a couple things. In a minute, well, when I run the video, I want you to look at the faces of the people that are in this next, in, in the video when I run that, all right? Look at them. They don't look like, you know, um, I'm gonna go off the rails for a moment. When I started in historic preservation, I went to a diversity conference. And when I walked into the diversity conference, there were 200 people, 190 white women, seven men, Caucasian, me, <laughs> a guy named uh, Bill Watanabe, and a black guy named Harrod Smith. So I walked into that conference, I'm like, this is diversity? <laughs> I, I don't think they, I, I, I don't think so. <laughs> so right after that, the three of us, right, we got together, Bill, Harriet, and I, we got together, hey, why don't we go have lunch? And so now the organization is kind of numbered in the thousands. It's growing quickly, and it has spurred on um, organizations for other groups that have similarities and strengths. Oops, I lost my slide. Um, but again, so what we're talking about, we, when we formed the organization, we fought hard for that PI up there. That's Pacific Islanders, because the statement was, oh, Asian Americans in historic preservation. But we're PI. When Asian Americans are talking about their historic sites, they're talking about locations in the mainland US 
where they had historic events happen to them. And some of them are amazing. You know, the war internment camps for the Japanese Americans, that's an amazing space. But what we as Pacific Islanders are talking about is historic spaces in our islands, in our communities, places that we go to all the time, right? We pass these things, we engage with these things all the time. So again, that's another example of the goal. So let's go to the next slide. So just recapping, because um, we are going to talk a little bit about social media just for a slide or two. Uh, but again, when I'm talking to the youth, and let's talk about that for a moment. So in historic preservation right now, some of the most historic things we deal with are the people. I'm considered young in historic preservation, and I ain't young. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So these kinds of messages and empowerment and skill building and building capacity, that happens for people that are younger than me, right? And it has to be sincere. So, you know, the message that we're taking out to what, you know, the people who want to describe themselves as mature or experienced is, okay, now your job is to mentor and guide other people younger. So show them and give them the opportunity to take the reins. This is their fight. So they're not gonna do it to your satisfaction. It's their future. They have to be the ones to decide what's important to them. In the same way that Pacific Islanders have to be the ones to determine what's important for them as historic preservation and cultural preservation, for the youth coming in, it's what they believe is important, not what we tell them is important. You know, so, again, it seems obvious, but it takes a nudge, you know? People have to evolve into that, that mentality. Um, and again, we always talk about educating our tourists um, so that they understand our Pacific Island heritage sites. I know that there was a huge social media backlash. There was a, a lady, in, I think she was on the Big Island, and she went to a sacred site in Hawaii and humped a kahaloa. A kahaloa is an altar. In Hawaii, that's an altar. She went up and she humped it and put it up on video, and it was, it, you know, war broke out, mental anguish broke out, right? But what was missing was, although there was a lot of anger, Right? Everybody was, you know, the local people were just up in arms. But the takeaway was you can be angry, but it has to be constructive. Know your laws. Did she break a law? Do you need to insert or create a law so that what she did was, is something that can be punished? It turns out it was something that can be punished, right? That, that the law does not allow you to do. But you have to be articulate. You have to educate yourself. It's not good enough and we can do better than to just jump into someone's Instagram and say, hey, dumbass, that's not cool. That's not articulately engaging in people and changing their outcome, right? Um, and then the other message that we have for people is that you know, heritage sites are vulnerable when they're forgotten and neglected. So we want people to engage with their historic sites, right? So you, you teach people, show people, um, create opportunities for people to interact with those historic sites, but they do it responsibly. And we have to be trained, we have to be, we have to be taught how to do that. Go to the next slide. slide. Okay, just keep tapping away. So these are the challenges or the platforms that we're dealing with. So we've got Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, uh, what else, oh, we got Tumblr. Uh, obviously we got Facebook, and then that's, well, WeChat, which I believe is very popular in China. So again, when we're talking about how you communicate, you know, likes, dislikes, that's not good enough. We gotta do better. Historic preservation, and your culture and your heritage deserve better than dislike or like, right? And again, that's when we talk about empowering younger people to take historic preservation reins, that's part of the message, right? You've got to communicate articulately. Cannot, it's just not good enough to shortcut your conversation about what is making historic preservationists angry or where a violation occurred, right? So, um, and I know, you know, it, it, this slide will 
show up a few times during this conference because again, a lot of times we take, you saw the word earlier, slacktivism. There's activism and slacktivism, right? After a while, sometimes people just get burnt out. They're like, eh, somebody else broke a law, and you just kind of turn the page. But that's, you know, that loss of energy often results in the loss of a historic space. Next slide. Yeah. So, and again, when we have people that are willing to put their walk the walk, talk the talk, Right? You've, you've got people that, that are committed to fighting, but it does not always have to be this situation anymore with people having signs out there. Remember that the platforms have taken a huge part of everybody's day. You want to find where the people are going, you know, they're on TikTok. So how do you get the message there? How do you communicate in those forums? That's, I think, an important message. So, Again, when we're talking about evolving and not doing things just the way we used to do it, we have to expand our abilities and our platforms and our method of getting the message out. Next slide. Yeah, so this is a video. Go ahead and run the video. There we go. I never touched a seal in my life. You, okay, you can actually stop the slide. Those bits of video, especially that one right there, I mean, these are endangered species many times or habitats where people were like, hey, I, that would be an awesome picture, me with the turtle. Except that you're not supposed to go near that turtle. So you have a choice. If you're an advocate, of this is you know, endangered species and, and habitat that's protected. So do you go onto that person's website or you know, a social media platform and give them a thumbs down? Or do you communicate? And they have very great, graciously given us um, proof when they violated a law. So is that, if you're gonna engage in that argument, figure out where best to send that video. Is that something that the JAG needs to see? Is that something, something that, you know, U.S. Fish and Wildlife needs to see? Because again, they're handing us the keys to run them over, right? So we'll go to one more slide. I think. Ah! Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so we'll run this one in just a second. But again, I was talking earlier about the Asian and Pacific Islanders, Americans in historic preservation. Some of you may have seen this video. This was our first official conference where we got together. And a lot like what we see when we do the preservation summit, we as Pacific Islanders have a lot in common, but we're not the same. We're all unique. But what we do is we find the similarities, find the shared issues that we have, and we build on that capacity, and we support one another, right? So if there's an issue that's happening in FSM, and they let us know about it, and we find that common platform, then we can support them, and vice versa. So wherever you are, if you're in Saipan, if you're in, if you're in Palau, if you're in you know, the, the, the Marshalls, we find those, those, those issues that we share and we support one another. But again, look at the people that you're gonna see in this video. They don't look like they came from a diversity conference 30 years ago in, you know, in, at the National Trust. Um, they come from different backgrounds, they, uh, different ethnic groups. And again, they found a way to work together and build on it. And so it's, it's working out pretty well, I would say. So again, the, the numbers continue to grow and it's getting a lot of the group, APIA HIP, is getting a lot of uh, support and attention. And that's really what ad advocacy needs. You need attention because if you're gonna go for funding, you need attention. 
Congress needs to know that this group over here is getting people's attention. We better pay attention too. We better start listening to the things that are important to them. So go ahead and run the video. This is probably one of the longer ones. This will run, I think, about five minutes. And yes, that is Ruby and Jesse. <laughs> In the past, cultural <laughs> preservation meant colonizers and others from the West documenting and collecting cultural artifacts unilaterally writing the world's history books, building elaborate museums that recounted the stories of how and where civilization began. Thankfully, in recent years, there has been a vocal outcry in large part by many of you to rethink our priorities, our processes, methodologies for cultural preservation and conservation. Increasingly, there has been an emphasis on bringing multiple and varying perspectives to the table. How do we make our history real for our future generations? And that means that right now we have to be engaged in saving what we have, what we've been given, and then finding ways to interest and encourage our young people to carry those cultural and historical traditions on. I think that's where a lot of the energy and a lot of, like, a lot of good new ideas will come from. Um, and when the like non-Asian, non-Pacific Islander community sees you know, young people and like everyone else getting so excited about the historic preservation efforts, it'll really kind of draw attention to it. I hope that we're able to really uh, help to change or, or move the agenda of what it means when we talk about historic cultural preservation, that it is much more inclusive. Without the contributions of Asian Americans in our country, our country would not look the way it looks and um, it wouldn't have come as far as quickly um, uh, without the contributions um, of our ancestors. So what we need to do in terms of Asian Pacific American kind of preservation is to maybe rethink what we mean by history or, or historical. Does it have to be 100 years? These sites are so important in understanding what has happened in the past so that future generations can appreciate what their ancestors have experienced. Historically, it, it's um, material that just needs to be preserved and, uh, and uh, stories that need to be told uh, to the rest of America. Trying to capture history, um, record history, create stories about just the experiences of being um, an Asian American. Um, I never realized that there's this, it really is this fabric of storytelling um, that's kind of happening at a national level. I feel that there's a lot of rich history that is untold, and I believe that it's our responsibility within our community to share these stories and bring them to surface rather than have others interpret how we must have lived. Trying to um, uh, pull out the stories from uh, the, the remaining ancestors, the aunties, who might remember something. No matter if somebody's age, somebody's ethnicity, or where they're from, there's that common core of wanting to pay forward and, and being able to help preserve something now, people's stories, people's areas, and paying that forward to the next generation. I really think there's kind of an aha moment or uh, sort of a conversion experience that many uh, people need to have that this is not something that's, uh, you know, you can push off to the back burner, but if we don't do what we need to do today, uh, historic resources could be lost forever. And I think from this moment, or, you know, kind of from this moment on, really feel that we have built community with one another. You know, that we have these shared visions and shared goals and that we can share best practices with each other and really, in, you know, inspire each other to continue to do preservation. We realize that uh, we're not alone. We realize that uh, the challenges are all the same. It adds so much depth to have this other layer infused through historic preservation. I had hair. Uh, you know, and I, I mean, the energy that the Asian and Pacific Island communities bring to their historic preservation effort, I mean, I, I just think that it could really reshape and reinvigorate historic preservation nationally. 
traditional way of historic preservation is kind of prohibiting, not really considering some of the grassroots, because that the API effort seems like uh, taking the lead in redefining historic preservation. People are needing to reevaluate what are museums, what is preservation, and what are you really preserving, and the stories and how the stories are told. I'm forcing a shift in thinking at, of historic preservation into more cultural preservation that has social equity built in. Because we realize that it's about a legacy and that these cultural sites, these uh, traditions that we're hoping to preserve, that's all that they really are, legacy, making sure that they're not forgotten. And by involving the youth in each step, we're ensuring our future. Uh, whether it be the histories that we, we tell, the stories that we tell, uh, whether it be the places that we save, uh, whether it be uh, the traditions, and we always need to preserve that connection between people and places. The National Register of Historic Places, which is the official federal list of building sites, objects, uh, structures that are the federal government says we need to preserve for the heritage of the United States to be told. Only 3% of those properties are associated with communities of color. Only 3%, and that is African American, Asian, Pacific Islander, and Native American. Within that 3%, Asian and Pacific Islanders only represent 4% of the communities, of the properties listed on the National Register. 47 are listed for Pacific Islander, 94 are represented for Asian American, and that is out of 85,000 listings. We want to empower people to see that it, preservation is preserving stories and experiences and uh, the value, and so Mount Vernon is not more important, you know, than the Yamato colony, you know, kind of thing, that each tells an important story that's part of the American experience. We need to keep talking. We need to keep sharing. The ancestors, my ancestors, are pulling me into the footprint of their history. A crossroad lies before us. Do we reenact the history played out on the many immigrant communities that have made the U.S. their home? Or do we emerge as proactive stewards to protect and defend, protect and conserve, protect and preserve what ties us back to who we are? My hopes for future API uh, historic preservation would be um, that we are integrated and are a bigger part of the mainstream efforts of historic preservation that, again, it's not just a subsection, but it, it gets integrated so much that people understand this is our history, our collective history. So that was a few years ago, and we're growing, we're getting smarter. We're evolving, we're changing with the issues that we're faced with. And I think that that's what has to continue happening. Um, again, when we had that conference, we literally had to sit down and think, okay, we're gonna have a large group of Filipinos in a room with a large group of Koreans, in a room with a large group of Japanese, in a room with a large group of, and will they play nice together? You know, how do we make sure that we focus on what our commonalities are? And, I mean, that's a bigger picture, but here in the Pacific Islands, that's the same challenge. How do we support one another? How do we keep each other informed? How do we share our resources? And again, together, how do we educate ourselves and advocate for our culture and our heritage in an intelligent, articulate, and successful way? And that's all I got. <laughs>
indigenous heritage issues as a, as a second topic. And we are working now to create uh, committees that bring community members together to, to really try to identify what the priorities are, identify what the weaknesses are. You know, I mean, in historic preservation, we can't just always talk about what went well. We have to talk about the things that didn't work. Yeah, so we were talking, like, with the indigenous traditions and cultures. You know, a moment ago, I was talking about traditional cultural properties. That is such a foreign term to everybody except Pacific Islanders. We know what those traditional cultural properties are. But if you say that in Boston, it's like they're going to go and find the oldest beer making factory in Boston. That's a traditional culture. I know I'm stereotyping. That was bad. But you know what I mean? It's like, again, we are the ones who know what that is. And so in, in that case with that program, it's really putting together the people and taking a real holistic look at what works and where we didn't work, where it didn't work out. I mean, again, I will tell you right now that we need to put more energy into bringing the youth into the program, into this mindset of preservation. There is a large effort that goes through in the college years, but it's not translating into professions. So they get all this energy, they get all these ideas, but where are they going to put this to work? So that's a failing on our part. It's like, okay, we need to find ways to put these people into jobs where they can use the passion that they feel and the education that they've gained in a productive way. Go ahead. I'm not aware of anything in a concerted effort, but see, that's a takeaway. So, you know, at the end of this conference, we're supposed to sit around and in a table and write down what we think some of these goals should be. That's a good one. Yeah, I know. Yeah. 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 Yes. Right, right. And again, so you were asking about the vision program, and you know, that's another good one. I mean, if we can get those kinds of ideas, that, that's a really that's awesome one. Please write that down. <laughs> you know, but again, it's, it's those kinds of specific programs and ideas that we need to now bring forward, right? I mean, Lana and I were talking just a moment ago about all these different opportunities there are with technology. And for me, it's like, we always balance it, because I love technology. I'm that guy who's always posting on WhatsApp, like, oh my god, look what Apple just did, and I don't even have an iPhone. <laughs> but, you know, again, it's that combination of training, education, and the technology, right? You know, and um, I think there's another area where I think there's a whole lane of people that are on the technology route, but they're not learning the other elements of it, the responsibilities, the articulation, um, and understanding where the laws and the violations can be and speaking intelligently to that. I mean, on Guam right now, we are, the, the SHPO is actually in the process of redrafting the historic preservation laws. I mean, that's an important thing because we are now dealing with historic preservation challenges we couldn't have imagined 30 years ago. You know, there was no law that said, oh, on TikTok, you shall not hump sacred places. You know, that, that's... So we're, we're now having to translate into real-time issues and problems that we're having. And, and then the other part of it is talking about things that don't work well in historic preservation. Understanding the business of it, managing your money, prioritizing, and then focusing on, you know, sequentially gaining the equipment or the training or the funding for personnel, right? I mean, we all want to do it, but there's this other step of actually planning out the details, 
right? So, you know, year after year, people come up with wonderful ideas. Okay, now let's, there's got to be this expedition, expediting component to the good ideas. Otherwise, the good ideas go back on the shelf with all the other good ideas. So again, like in terms of, that's a real matter of fact failing that we have in preservation communities. We all have great ideas and priorities, but you've got to think about how to get the money, how to get the law drafted, how to get uh, public outreach happening on something like that, how to train people for enforcing whatever the new idea or, or plan is going to be. Yeah? Okay, go ahead. You know, I think part of the, the discussion should also include to what extent we use technology in historic preservation discussions and practices. Uh, I, I, this presentation made me think of a recent uh, burial that um, you know my auntie passed away you know last year and you know everybody's got so the boys were at the grave so uh, it was a uh, it was a tomb for my grandmother that yeah. they unearthed and laid my auntie in but anyway long story short I had a cousin there who was like filming the whole thing right and like posting it to the whatsapp group chat and then we had an auntie who was like what are you doing take all this stuff down now yeah. Right, so I think there needs to be discussion about the balance between to what extent we want to discover and yeah. disturb with technology versus dignity, just knowing it's there and leaving it alone, right, yeah. and just yeah. respecting that space. For us, the Pacific Islanders, dignity is right. so important, you know, and that's that's absolutely an important thing that we have to, you know, we have to get a hold of it, right, and it's more than just making sure that we in the Pacific Island communities understand that dignity has its obligations. It's making sure that people that are not in our community know that this is important. And if you mess with it, <laughs> we mess with you. <laughs> in a very intelligent, articulate way, we're taking you down. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, it's not archaeology related, but there, oh, I heard that. <laughs> a law that required um, Mariana's Visitors Authority to have a certif to, uh, certi to certify tour guides. Mm -hmm. And so um, all of the tour companies struggled to be compliant with that. And they had to go through a course mm -hmm. that made sure they were aware of culturally sensitive sites and their actions in those culturally sensitive sites. You know, like um, Grotto is a very sacred site. Although it's a beautiful tourist site, we treat it very differently than when the tourists come there. And so, you know, just prior to COVID, we saw pictures of like 2,000 people, tourists in Grotto, like in one day, and we're all like, oh, someone needs to do something right away, you know. Um, it, it's not archeologically archeolo related, but that's kind of the response that the CNMI had is to train the tour guides to, for them to tell their tourists yep. what to do and what not to do. Now, whether that really happened once the tour guides took their certification, I, I don't think it, you know, that, that became now an enforcement issue yep. because it, you know, you still see them screaming and, you know, disrespecting the, the cultural site. But anyway, that, 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 that was just a, well, and, and that, those are the kinds of things, okay, so you've started a program, but it has to have the continuity, right? There has to be, you know, follow-up programs, and those need to be funded, and those need to be brought back up, and that's what the advocates do. They say, okay, look, we started something, and it was working, but A, B, C, D things happened, and now it's kind of got pushed to the side. It's time for us to bring that back up and make it a priority again. I mean, because I remember the program too, they, you know, we were, I, I was involved in that and we were, you know, we had to make sure that we had the program available in different languages, you know, and making sure that when the stories were being told, they were correct, <laughs> not, you know, somebody making stuff up. I was like, you know, a walrus came to Saipan. <laughs> no, the walrus never came to Saipan. <laughs> right. <laughs> 
I shouldn't laugh, but yeah, you know, you're, you'd be amazed at how, you know, odd it can be. And again, we just have to always kind of, I, I hang on intelligence. We've got to intelligently engage in these things, you know. I mean, it's too easy to say, what a dumbass, <laughs> you know. But it, it, that doesn't hold the day. It's what you do with your programs, your codes, your laws, and your uh, interpretive signage, and all those other things that, hold, that, that win the day. <laughs> Come on. For example, we were really successful at finding fish weirs. Um, they, they pop out, they're great. Um, where you have a topographical difference. Now the problem is, where are you trying to use LIDAR on, let's say, places that have been bulldozed in the past? And, uh, you know, speaking of Saipan, near and dear to me, you know, 90% of that island was cleared. Uh, Sugarcane production was, was basically a terraformed island. I know of sites that were found there later where um, uh, down near um, PIC where they, they found um, a, a large square hole with, you know, I think there was a couple hundred burials in there that had come out of various, probably out of Lottie sites that it was, a, um, it was done during Japanese times and was probably seen as a respectful way to deal with that. Um, now, LIDAR is probably not going to come up with that, uh, and especially on islands that, again, that have had um, severe combat. Um, again, the, the surface has been reworked, um, and um, that, it's reflecting off that surface. So you are, you're looking at the, the latest historical surface, and uh, often that's, it doesn't help that much. And then p from a, another important archaeological thing is that out here, particularly in Lottie period, um, the vast majority of our sites are probably pottery scatters and, and artifact scatters that I, I just don't think will ever show up under LIDAR. And, and I, think, I think, okay, so really good points because remember, LIDAR is a tool. It's not going to become the industry. LIDAR is not the new idea of archaeology. It's a tool that archaeologists can use sometimes under the, correct, uh, the correct conditions. But remember, it's like technology, right? It will, it can change. There may be some other version of light detection that, that completely replaces it. But understanding what it is you want from the equipment is as important as the equipment itself, right? So again, if we can find things that help us to discover but not disturb, cool. That's always a goal, right? So we have to keep vigilant and keep aware of when those opportunities are changing. Because again, they, they have changed significantly over even just the last couple of years. So, but really good points, Lon. Any more? <laughs> Okay, well, if there's no other questions, um, we'll go ahead and just present this to you, Mr. McHugh, on behalf of the Guam Preservation Trust. Um, we are um, extremely grateful and appreciative for all that you do for preservation, for being here and sharing um, all of your work with all of us here today. So thank you so much. And I've known this guy since he was like that tall. Did you sign your